nothing that keeps wicked men at any moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. By the mere pleasure of God, I mean his sovereign pleasure, his arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation, hindered by no manner of difficulty, any more than if nothing else but God's mere will had in the least degree, or in any respect whatsoever, any hand in the preservation of wicked men one moment. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can most easily do it. What are we that we should think to stand before him at whose rebuke the earth trembles, before whom the rocks are thrown down? They deserve to be cast into hell. So the divine justice never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Yea, on the contrary, justice calls aloud for an infinite punishment of their sins. Divine justice. Justice says of the tree that brings forth such grapes of Sodom, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? The sword of divine justice is every moment brandished over their heads, and it is nothing but the hand of arbitrary mercy and God's mere will that holds it back. They are already under a sentence of condemnation to hell. They do not only justly deserve to be cast down thither, but the sentence of the law of God, that eternal and immutable rule of righteousness that God has fixed between him and mankind, is gone out against them and stands against them so that they are bound over already to hell. He that believeth not is condemned already so that every unconverted man properly belongs to hell. That is his place from thence he is. Ye are from beneath. Thither he is bound. It is the place the justice and God's word and the sentence of his unchangeable law assigned to him. They are now the subjects of that very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go down to hell at each moment is not because God in whose power they are is not then very angry with them as he is with many miserable creatures now tormented in hell who there feel and bear the fierceness of his wrath. Yea, God is a great deal more angry with great numbers that are now on earth, yea, doubtless with many that are now in this congregation, who it may be are at ease than he is with many of those who are now in the flames of hell. So that is not because God is unmindful of their wickedness and does not resent it that he does not let loose his hand and cut them off. God is not altogether such a one as themselves, though they imagine him to be so. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit hath opened its mouth under them. Natural men's prudence and care to preserve their own lives or the care of others to preserve them do not secure them a moment. To this divine providence and universal experience do also bear testimony. There is this clear evidence that men's own wisdom is no security to them from death that if it were otherwise, we should see some difference between the wise and politic men of the world and others with regard to their libelness to early and unexpected death. But how is it in fact? Ecclesiastes 2.16 How dieth the wise man, even as the fool? All wicked men's pains and contrivance, which they use to escape hell, while they continue to reject Christ and so remain wicked men, do not secure them from hell one moment. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, in what he is now doing or what he intends to do. 
Everyone lays out matters in his own mind, how he shall avoid damnation and flatters himself that he contrives well for himself and that his schemes will not fail. They hear, indeed, that there are but few saved, and that the greater part of men that have died heretofore are gone to hell, but each one imagines that he lays out matters better for his own escape than others have done. He does not intend to come to that place of torment. He says within himself that he intends to take effectual care and to order matters so for himself as not to fail. But the foolish children of men miserably delude themselves in their own schemes. And in confidence in their own strength and wisdom, they trust in nothing but a shadow. There are black clouds of God's wrath now hanging directly over your heads, full of the dreadful storm and big with thunder. And were it not for the restraining hand of God, it would immediately burst forth upon you. It is true that judgment against your evil works has not been executed hitherto. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld, but your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing and you are every day treasuring up more wrath. The waters are constantly rising and waxing more and more mighty and there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back that are unwilling to be stopped and press hard to go forward. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate. It would immediately fly open and the fiery floods of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with omnipotent power and if your strength were 10,000 times greater than it is, yea, 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell, it would be nothing to withstand or endure it. The bow of God's wrath is bent. The arrow is made ready on the string. And justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it's nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus all you that never pass under a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls. All you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead in sin to a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. However you may have reformed your life in many things and may have had religious affections and may keep up a form of religion in your families and closets and in the house of God. It is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction. Consider this, you that are here present, that yet remain in an unregenerate state that God will execute the fierceness of his anger implies that he will inflict wrath without any pity. When God beholds the ineffable extremity of your case and sees your torment to be so vastly disproportioned to your strength and he sees how your poor soul is crushed and sinks down as it were into an infinite gloom, he will have no compassion upon you. He will not forbear the executions of his wrath, or in the least light in his hand, there shall be no moderation or mercy. Nor will God then at all stay his rough wind. He will have no regard to your welfare, nor be at all careful lest you should suffer too much in any other sense, than only that you shall not suffer beyond what strict justice requires. Nothing shall be withheld because it is so hard for you to bear. Ezekiel 8, 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Now God stands ready This is a day of mercy. 
you may cry now with some encouragement of obtaining mercy. But when once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and dolorous cries and shrieks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away of God as to any regard to your welfare. God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You shall be continued in being to no other end, for you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, and there will be no other use of this vessel but to be filled full of wrath. God will be so far from pitying you when you cry to him that it is said he will only laugh and mock. And you children who are unconverted, do not you know that you are going down to hell to bear the dreadful wrath of that God who is now angry with you every day and every night? Will you be content to be the children of the devil when so many other children in the land are converted and are become the holy and happy children of the king of kings? And let everyone that is yet out of Christ and hanging over the pit of hell, whether they be old men and women, or middle-aged, or young people, or little children, now hearken to the loud calls of God's word and providence. This acceptable year of the Lord, a day of such great favors to some, will doubtless be a day of as remarkable vengeance to others. Men's hearts harden, and their guilt increases apace at such a day as this. If they neglect their souls, and never was there so great a danger of such persons being given up to hardness of heart and blindness of mind. Therefore, let everyone that is out of Christ now awake and fly from the wrath to come. The wrath of Almighty God is now undoubtedly hanging over a great part of this congregation. Let everyone fly out of Sodom. Haste and escape for your lives. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed.